Wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, thank you especially to all of our candidates who are with us today. So thank you. This is going to be an exciting event. This candidates forum has been organized by DA France, Germany, Spain, and UK. I'm Danny Follett, chair of DA France, and I'll be moderating the first half of today's event. Second half is going to be moderated by Kenton Barnes, uh, chair of DA Germany. Kathy Toulos, who's chair of DA Spain, will be our timekeeper, and Brett McCarg, who's chair of DA UK, is going to be moderating the, moderating the queue. And another piece of housekeeping before we start, I'd like to ask people, please do not use emojis as we go through the session, uh, because it creates a problem for um, the uh, 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 on, online, it, it creates a problem. Uh, so we need to avoid using emojis. Um, today, so we're going to meet our candidates for International Secretary, Treasurer, and Council. Now, all of the candidates were invited, but not all answered, and not all were able to make it. And so um, we will have a second candidate session this Saturday, this Friday, where we'll be hearing from candidates for chair and vice chair. The first thing we're going to do is hear our candidate statements. So we'll have 2.5 minutes each. First for the candidates for secretary, then treasurer, then council. Now the order of candidates has been randomized and uh, then we'll go into candidates answering a series of pre-selected questions. Uh, the questions were gathered from participants in advance using the Google form or they've been proposed by the organizers. Nobody has seen the list of questions in advance except for us uh, four organizers and the orders is all, also going to be randomized. The answers again will be two and a half minutes each for the answers for the questions. Okay, and then we'll go into the second half of our event and we'll have an open question period. Questions will be answered by all the candidates for each position. So unless your question is personally oriented to a you know, particular person, that is, for example, what did you mean when you said X? That is possible. You can orient a question to a particular candidate, but if it's not a particularly you know, personalized question, then it will be answered by all of the question, all of the candidates for that position. So to ask, ask a question during that time, please write hand up in the chat, star star hand up in the chat, and tell us which position it's for. And then we'll just go in the order of questions received in the chat. Uh, and as always, keep your questions extremely brief. We'll keep, we'll cut you off if necessary. And also, if you have questions, don't put your hand up in the chat until we get to that period. So for the first half of the, of the session, let's uh, uh, you know, keep the chat clear. And then when we come to that time, you can put your hand up in the chat for questions. Okay, so now I, when, through the 2.5 minutes for each candidate for your statements, uh, when you come to 10 seconds before the end of your statement, Kathy is going to wave at you like this. Is that okay? So Kathy, like that? Right. So Kathy right there, she's waving. So keep your eye on Kathy. She's our timekeeper and she's gonna be very strict. So 10 seconds, you'll get a wave. And then at two and a half minutes exactly, she's gonna cut you off. Okay, alrighty. So do you, do you mind if I just throw in that that waving might not work for everybody uh, if they have vision problems? Uh, so uh, uh, yes. maybe you wanna just also um, take the opportunity to, I don't know, say, 10 seconds or something like that out loud. Would that be best for every, for, for if the waving might not be an appropriate thing for everybody, is that true? So, yes, okay, all right, then we will uh, also, Kathy, you should also say something. Okay, so, so make that clear verbally as well. Thank you very much, Marnie. Okay, so let's jump in and we will go into, uh, without further ado, we'll go into our candidate statements. So we'll start with our candidates for uh, secretary. Uh, now, is Susan McKenzie here? Has Susan arrived? Let's see. I don't believe that I've seen her name in the participants list. She's not in the participant list. Okay, so okay, so Susan McKenzie's candidate for secretary is not here. So we will go then to uh, Karen Frankenstein. Karen, I uh, will give you two and a half minutes. Please go ahead. You're on uh, mute. Karen, Karen, we don't hear you. Well, that would help. Thank you so much. Um, I'm an Arizona voter. I live in Munich, Germany. And I'm a foreign service kid, so I've really been a Democrat abroad pretty much forever. 
uh, our family has always been Democrats. Um, so not being a Democrat was simply not an option for us. Um, I moved to Germany in 2006 for work. Um, I'm actually a trained opera singer. And while I was at my first job, I met my husband and we currently now live in Munich. So I started out volunteering for DA after Trump was elected uh, with the global IT team. I really, really loved it. So I put up my hand and I started volunteering for other extra related work like the IT liaison for the global volunteer coordinator. And it kind of snowballed from there. So I'm currently the global caucus coordinator. I'm lead for the global events team and I run point for the help desk for all of the global teams. I've seen how building well-supported and diverse imaginative teams is really crucial to getting out the democratic vote. And I believe that we can do it in numbers that we have not yet seen. I can help our teams really get there. I think DA needs to be a place of joy and excitement and fun for all of the extraordinary volunteers who make things happen. So that's you guys. And to allow this to be the organization that we envision, we need to minimize the bureaucratic red tape so that we can maximize the results of our volunteers. I have worked with nearly all of the organizational tools that we use at DA, and the secretary role actually manages quite a lot of these. Our success not only depends on these platforms, but on understanding the synergies of these programs and the teams that use them. We have to recognize that these tools are what can make or break our plans, and we need a great team with great plans. So please vote for me. Um, I have the tools to hit the ground running, and that's why I'm running for secretary. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, and thank you for keeping on time. Wonderful. So now we'll turn to our candidate for uh, treasurer, Josh Vanderplug. Please, Josh, you've got two and a half minutes. Hi, everyone. My name is Josh Vanderplug, and I would like to thank the NEC for authorizing this event uh, and DA France, Germany, Spain, and UK for hosting us today. I vote in Florida where my parents now live, although I'm a Michigan native and I call Michigan home. I've lived in London for almost 13 years and have been a, a member of Democrats Abroad essentially all of that time. By day, I work as a lawyer for a major multilateral development bank, a job that allows me to combine my skill set in law and finance with my passion for pursuing social and economic justice around the world. As international treasurer, I will work with country committees, global caucuses, committees, and task forces to formulate a comprehensive two-year budgeting strategy to take us all the way through the next election cycle, including planning both fundraising and foreseeable expenditures. On the fundraising and revenue side, we should establish a schedule for periodic fundraising drives throughout the cycle, including asking leaders across the organization to host fundraising activities to support both, board, to support both the global and country committee budgets. On the expenditure side, we should establish a rainy day fund to ensure that if we ever find ourselves facing financial difficulties, we will always maintain an adequate reserve to be able to handle any unforeseen costs. Finally, I would also support the creation of a standing global fundraising committee and a global finance committee. A standing global fundraising committee would ensure that we are coordinating fundraising efforts at all levels of the organization so that we can develop a comprehensive fundraising strategy and justify to donors how we will utilize their money where it is most needed to fulfill our mission and mobilize the overseas vote. A global finance committee would serve an audit function to review Democrats Abroad's budget and financial statements. The committee would have access to the DPCA's budget, bank account statements, and financial reports, and would be tasked with meeting at least twice a year with the international chair, treasurer, and XCOM as a whole to assess Democrats Abroad's finances. The committee would present an annual report both to the international XCOM and the entire DPCA membership on its activities and any of its findings on our financial position. As the finance committee would be a new function in Democrats Abroad's governance structure, I am proposing to adopt this on a temporary but two-year basis at first, following which the DPCA can assess its performance and decide whether to make it a standing committee as well. I look forward to discussing these ideas and answering any Ten questions seconds. you may have. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Josh. Uh, and thank you for keeping it to time. Now let's go to our uh, our candidates for council. 
and I've randomized the order of the statements. So we'll start with Anne Brady. Anne, please go ahead. Two and a half minutes. Thank you, Danny. Um, I am running because I believe that there's a need for a dramatic culture shift in the Office of the International Council. The role of an attorney is to provide legal advice, prepare and review legal documents, and represent their clients. It generally is not to act as a watchdog, to threaten <coughs> clients, or to browbeat them. Although many country committees have their own council members, the International Council should be of service to the entire organization. And although the International Council is a U.S. attorney, they also have an obligation to help DA work within the parameters of the laws of the host countries where DA operates. Country committee councils where they exist are often most knowledgeable on those local laws and should be valuable partners on these questions, not adversaries. I've been DA Ireland Council for a little over three years. Some of you know me from my involvement in the FEC compliance issue. However, that was issue was not my first introduction to the Office of International Counsel. That happened in 2021 when DA Ireland was having great difficulty scheduling its AGM due to the COVID lockdowns. We couldn't schedule an indoor meeting because the rules kept changing in terms of how many people could be in a party and how far apart the parties had to be seated. Venues were very limited in terms of booking groups. We finally were able to book something, but our then chair provided slightly inadequate notice as to when that meeting was going to take place to our members. I contacted International Council, hoping to be able to work something out. He agreed to a Zoom call, but then instead of the two of us, it wound up being five people from the XCOM lecturing me. Um, the International Council started out the meeting by angrily telling me that Ireland needed to, quote, get its shit together. And things just went downhill from there. The next time I spoke with him was during an informational session on the FEC policy where he said he could understand why a layperson such as myself wouldn't understand why a 45-year-old advisory opinion had the full weight of the law. At a recent international XCOM meeting, I was horrified to hear International Council berate a vice chair who merely Second. sought participation on a procedure, telling her that she didn't understand English. Again, this is why I'm running because I want to ensure Time. that there is a dramatic Time. Great, thank you so much, Anne. Moving on, we'll now go to Summer Tillman. Summer, please, you've got two and a half minutes. Okay, um, please bear with me. I'm actually um, in isolation due to COVID. So I am here seeking your support and your vote for International Council um, on a macro level because I believe in democracy and the strength of our collective voice. Um, we are at a very crucial moment in history where voting um, is just not enough anymore. And after four years of our democracy being system systematically dismantled and undermined, I watched as half of the country voted against democracy. So what we've been doing as a party and as a country just simply is not enough. It's not working. We need everyone. Um, we need to use all of the tools that are available to us, which includes social media, which includes um, mobilizing the young, which includes mobilizing quiet Democrats and so on. I am currently head of legal of a prominent European tech company that does business in over 180 countries. So I do this legal work every day. I possess a deep understanding of international law, which means that I can guide Democrats abroad through the legal intricacies that we are currently facing. I'm also in charge of data privacy and therefore GDPR, which is key to this position. And I hope that I get to get to tell you more about my legal qualifications, but I am, I can assure you that this is not just about that. Um, I've proposed that the International Council's office can be a place that can be outward facing and that can serve um, not just Democrats abroad in terms of the organization, but Democrats who are abroad. Um, which would drive membership to the organization if the Democrats abroad had a place that was, um, if, if the Democrat, if the International Council's office was a place that was publicized as, a, as an outward facing office and a place that could help. Um, and the last thing I want to say is that I am definitely an outsider, and that's part of the reason why I am running for this office. Um, because this campaign is not just about you. It's not just about me. It's not just about the members. The members are only 200,000 of millions of Democrats abroad. Um, sorry, that's my own 
Um, and because of that, I believe that we are in a, we, we have a sacred job, which is to pick the best person for the job um, and pick the best, insist on democracy at every level, which includes, includes this one. So that's my statement. Great, thank you so much, Summer. Wonderful. And finally, we'll come now to our final uh, candidate for council, which, uh, who is Heather Stone. Please go ahead, Heather, two and a half minutes. Thank you very much, Danny. Thank you to the hosts of this evening. I'm Heather Stone. I live in Tel Aviv, Israel, and I vote in New Jersey. In 2016, I led the effort to reconstitute DA Israel. I served as chair from 2017 to 2021, and since then as vice chair. I served on the 2020 platform committee and I'm a founding member of the Global Disability Caucus. After introducing a unanimously supported resolution to advocate for Medicare portability, the Medicare Portability Task Force was created and I chair it. I have served as Deputy International Counsel Global since 2021. I'm especially proud of my leading role in obtaining directors and officers insurance that covers all our volunteers at all levels, from chapters, country committees, caucuses, task forces, to the international XCOM, and anyone who reports to them. This is meaningful protection to our growing organization and allows our leaders to act with the knowledge that they have insurance against claims. I've been a practicing lawyer for over 30 years in New Jersey and Israel, including as a partner with one of the largest corporate law firms in Israel until 2017. I've worked in US securities law, international mergers and acquisitions, and internal investigations of publicly traded companies, appearing before the SEC and PCAOB. I led teams of lawyers on many complex international transactions and investigations. I left private practice six years ago following brain surgery when I lost my eyesight. In the last two years, having mastered use of the screen reader and other advanced technologies, I began serving as Deputy International Counsel, handling all manner of matters for DA, both large and small. I'm running for International Counsel because I believe it is crucial that DA has strong, independent counsel who offers solid advice to the International XCOM on the full range of issues it faces. The role of International Counsel is both as a voting member and also as a watchdog to ensure the DA acts properly according to its bylaws, charter, and codes, and all applicable laws and regulations. In my decades of legal work and volunteer experience, I have learned to work collaboratively and respectfully as a lawyer with over 30 years of private practice experience. I believe I can perform this function at the highest level, Time. following the law Time. and pra seeking practical solutions. Time. Great, thank you so much. Okay, so we're gonna now go into our next segment of our evening or afternoon, I should say, or morning, depending where you are, uh, which is going into the questions that have been proposed in advance and will be asked of all of the candidates for a particular position. So we'll go back to secretary. And uh, since we only have one candidate for secretary, the question will be oriented to Karen. Uh, and the question is, Karen, uh, the following. The secretary position requires a strong time commitment and great attention to detail. How will you manage the many duties involved and what will you bring to the position? You have two and a half minutes, please. Thank you. Um, it is very detail oriented. I've had the pleasure of working with four international secretaries before I decided to run. And I have to say, um, my hat is off to all of them. They've done really good work. Um, I do think that because of my IT background and because of my experience in this organization, I already know quite a lot about how things work. And I have quite a few ideas about how to make things a little easier just for the secretary position. But in doing that, I think it's important that those this extra time that the secretary would then have can also spill over a little and fall into something that I haven't yet seen the secretary do, which is, and I will say this not being on a CC um, XCOM, but I think the secretary needs to be more of a conduit between the global XCOM and the CCs. 
I think um, it's very difficult for a lot of people to keep track and to show up at international meetings and raise their hand and speak in front of everybody. This is something that the secretary can help with. If the secretary, and I do have some ideas about this, can help get rid of some of the bureaucratic things that we are stuck with at the moment. This is not a reflection on anybody who has been in office so far. We've just reached the tipping point. We're almost 200,000 members. And we grew from a very small organization very, very fast. And we're going to get a lot more people next year. In order to reduce bureaucracy, we need to have a really good team. I think that the secretary is the person who can make things happen. I'm currently doing a lot of coordinating. That's essentially what the, the secretary should be doing. They should have their finger on the pulse of the organization. The secretary needs to know what are people thinking? What, pe what would people like to do? And the secretary should be the one to go to the XCOM and say, hey, these people wanna do these things. Can we build this into our plan and make their lives easier? That's what I think um, I would like to do as secretary. That's what I would bring. I really think a lot about the organization and I try not to think in individual units. I think it's more Ten seconds. to think as a whole and also to act as a team with a plan. Yeah, wonderful, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you, Karen. Uh, okay, now a question for our candidate for treasurer. Uh, the following, so Josh. The organization has previously had difficulty finding a suitably qualified international treasurer. What makes you qualified for the role and how would you build up capacity in the organization so that you have adequate support and a potential successor when the time comes? Well, I would maybe take uh, issue with the premise of the question. I think we've had some some qualified treasurers in the past, but but I hope to be to be among them. Um, what I would bring, uh, and I hope what makes me qualified, and I, I, obviously all of you will be the judge of whether I'm qualified, but what I believe makes me qualified is uh, that I was I was the treasurer of DA UK for four years, um, during which time I actually adopted many of the things that I'm proposing now. I adopted a, a two-year uh, budgeting strategy that takes us all the way through to each federal election cycle. Um, I view the budget as a living document, which kind of starts conservative, uh, but you know, as we uh, move along and hopefully have some good fundraising opportunities. We're able to kind of open it up and and uh, be a bit more kind of uh, liberal, I, I guess you could say, in our uh, in how we how we manage our funds. Um, and then I adopted uh, a financial accounting system that was based on kind of a nonprofit gap uh, general accounting principles uh, method, uh, uh, so that we can have a standardized um, presentation of our of our financial statements, particularly a balance sheet. And although you know all of our expenditures are public in our FEC documents, they're not necessarily so, super easy to understand what's going on. So what I did was I, I broke it down so that each line item was attributed to a caucus, a committee, a task force under either kind of what, what I consider program expenses, which is our core, uh, you know, GOTV and, and membership engagement expenses, and then what I consider our administrative expenses. So IT, our infrastructure, uh, in the UK, we have one paid employee as well. Um, so, so breaking down so that even though they are, you know, very uh, detailed financial statements, hopefully they will make sense even to a lay person. And then the third thing I did was that every time we had what in the UK we call the council, which is kind of like the DPCA voting body, uh, I presented a treasurer's report and I tried to break down the detailed financial statements and the budget into a an easy to comprehend and understand spreadsheet um uh, not not spreadsheet i mean powerpoint presentation so that so that uh every element of of our incomings and outgoings uh was presented to to our membership in a way that that hopefully Ten would seconds. make sense to people uh, and that people could could ask quest detailed questions about that i will bring to the to the international treasurer's role as well i didn't have to get time to get into this but i also want to have deputy treasurers Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Josh. Um, all right, now we'll go on to a series of questions for our, uh, or a question for our different candidates for council. Uh, and the order of answers has been randomized again. The first person answering this will be Summer, and then Anne, and then Heather. Okay. And so now the question is, uh, now DA's code of conduct is out of date. Will you review and revise it? 
how do you see the council's role in ensuring that DA is free from harassment and other breaches of the code of conduct? Please go ahead, Summer, you have two and a half minutes. Um, I would say that I would like to clarify what my view of the International Council's role as. And I think one thing I haven't heard anyone talk about is um, sort of an impartial guide. Um, I am I am as much of an outsider as, as, as possible, I would say. And what that means is I'm really not in bed with anybody in terms of um, like the only, the only desired outcome is the best outcome. So um, that that's uh, sort of um, my stand on where, um, where, well, two things I want to say. Number one, I have COVID brain. I'm still testing positive for COVID. Two, if you see me eating, I'm, I'm, I'm it's cough drops. Um, but could you repeat the question again, please? Of course. Yes. I'm so sorry <laughs> that you have COVID brain. That's not an easy thing to deal with. So yeah, much sympathy. The question is, so it's about the code of conduct. DA has a code of right. conduct and it is out of date. So will you review and revise it? Yes. Yes, and that, how would you yes. see your role as keeping us free of from harassment and other breaches of the code of conduct? Yes. Um, so the the my, in my day to day life, I am the general counsel, which is head of legal for a big international tech company. We're in 180 different um, countries. So what that means is that I'm responsible for ensuring that a lot of people are not harassed. Um, so my general idea is that. Um, compliance is the best way to ensure that we're not harassed. And so um, obviously I don't want to put undue burden on any of the individual chapters or anything, but generally speaking, um, the closer you are to compliance, the less there's issues with being harassed. So thank you very much for repeating that question. Great, no, my pleasure, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, next uh, up is Anne, Anne Brady. So you have two and a half minutes on this question. Oh, thanks, Danny. Um, yes, obviously, I think the code of conduct should be reviewed and revised, but you know, I wouldn't want to, um, even if it were possible to do that in isolation, we need as much input from all the countries, from all the country committees, from all the leadership in terms of what they would like to see and what's appropriate. Um, and then I would like to add that more important and keeping it reviewed and revised is enforcing the provisions that we already have in place. I mentioned briefly in my opening statement about a recent XCOM meeting where our vice chair asked, asked a question and um, was told my answer was written in English. You know, if you could understand English, you'd know what my answer says. People are spoken to with real contempt at some of these meetings and nothing is done about it, it just keeps going on. Um, I think we have maybe a slightly outdated code, but nevertheless, we have one and it's not being properly enforced. And I think um, I would hope that whoever the new chair is, that that person is going to enforce that code of conduct in, in meetings and in all dealings. We need to treat each other with respect, not just not fail to harass each other, but be respectful of each other. And, um, and that applies to meetings as well as to conversations um, just in general. That's all I have. Great, thank you so much, Heather. Um, Diane, sorry. Uh, next, we'll hear from Heather. So, Heather, please, you have two and a half minutes. Thank you, thank you, Danny. So, the short answer is yes. I would review the um, code of conduct and uh, would try to revise that. Uh, it's something that uh, is sorely needing uh, a, a review. Um, it's something that uh, the Council of Council already started to take a look at uh, in the past, and I would hope that uh, we would be able to continue that process, and I would like to engage with the um, councils in the country committees in order to get their feedback. Um, it's something that, uh, if elected, I would like to engage generally with uh, councils, with the councils and the country committees in order to have some sort of iterative process in, uh, in hearing their, their feedback about uh, policies that we want to um, 
update and revise and, uh, and to engage with them in that process. Um, in terms of uh, keeping us free from harassment, I think that's an element of our code of conduct that has not been well developed. It has, it's a section of our code of conduct so that is uh, sorely lacking. I'm voting for. It's, yeah. uh, and uh, I think someone's speaking over me. Um, uh, and uh, and so that's an element of our code of conduct that needs to be worked on and further developed. And of course, there are certain standards uh, for international organizations that uh, should be referred to and, uh, and adapted um, for the specifics of DA. Um, and uh, I look forward to working on that. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Heather. Okay, so now we'll do another round for uh, questions coming back to secretary. Uh, so this question will then be for Karen. Okay, so Karen, uh, although this is a decision for the whole XCOM, how do you think we should manage our internal communications to make sure that all leaders and DPCA members are receiving the necessary information? What would you do to help facilitate this? Please, you have two and a half minutes. Well, I think that we have a certain number of platforms that are already used for emails. And what I've heard from people is that they're getting too many emails. And when they get emails, um, they don't read them because there are too many of them. And we have an internal communications platform called Mobilize. Um, I hope that everybody on this call is also on it. And But Mobilize, I feel very strongly, isn't being used in the way that it was meant to be used. Mobilize isn't meant to be used for conversations, nor should it be used for top-down just announcements because that isn't really the purpose of internal communication. We need to hear what everybody else has to say. But I feel that the way Mobilize has technically been set up needs to be improved. You can set up Mobilize so that you don't get a message every time somebody puts something on there. Uh, you can set it up so that you only get a daily digest. And that should really be the default for our internal communications. We all, some people don't have a daily job, but some people do. And even if you don't have a job that you're at nine to five, you do not need to open up your phone and see 126 mobilized messages. We also, I feel strongly, um, don't need to use platforms that are going to make you create new email addresses. You should have an email address that you use only for DA. Uh, those of you who've been on my IT trainings have heard this before. Use one email for your DA stuff. And that should be the one that you use for Mobilize. And if you're in a Google group, use that one too. But the point is all of these groups can be set up so that you don't get 16 messages a day. You only get one. And I think that that should be set up and it should be implemented. And then if people want to change that, they are free to do that. But we should make it easy for people. And in Mobilize, what the great thing is, if somebody sends a message on Mobilize, you do not need to read it in your email. You can just go to the Mobilize platform. So that's one of the things that I think we can do. 10 um, seconds. We also need to look at other platforms, but that's the one that everybody's complaining about. So that is what I've chosen to discuss. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Karen. Um, okay, now a question for Josh as treasurer. The following, DA's banking and accounting systems have become much more complex in the past year. How do you propose to manage this complexity using what tools and resources, including other volunteer resources? Sure. Go ahead. Well, thanks, Danny. Actually, that's probably a good place to pick up with where I was leaving off on my first answer, which is that I would like to establish a, a treasury of treasurers, I guess you could say, mm -hmm. uh, a, a team of deputy treasurers um, who would who would be able to to assist with this. Um, I actually did serve as a deputy treasurer briefly uh, when Quinn Gwen was uh, was international treasurer, uh, and I saw that it actually can work pretty well um, to have kind of a team of of people with different kind of uh, skill sets and backgrounds who can add add things to the uh, to to the to the group. I mean, fundamentally, the treasurer has three tasks, preparing the budget, preparing the financial statements, and filing the FEC reports, uh, and then reporting on all of those to the, to the body. Um, I would like to have a team of deputy international treasurers 
who would then liaise with country committee treasurers as well. Um, because now that we are doing consolidated financials uh, with both the global uh, and the country committee accounts, I think it's more important than ever to have a, an open two-way conversation uh, and channel uh, between global and, and the country committee treasurers. Uh, so I, 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 I want to establish that, that culture of trust um, so that we are in constant dialogue, understanding what's, what is the big picture and what are the individual trees uh, in the forest so that we are not having any surprises so that country committees have confidence in the in the global financials, uh, which hopefully will develop a virtuous cycle where we can build trust with our with our country committees, build trust with our donor base, and that tends to have positive dividends of getting donors to open up their wallets as well. Um, so I think that's in a in a nutshell where I hope to go. I do recognize that there is additional complexity now, but I think it's manageable complexity, uh, and I think that you know there are still speed bumps along the way, but but we are getting there. Um, we have, I guess the last thing that I would add is that I want to develop kind of a, a clear template system so that country committee treasurers, uh, newly elected country committee treasurers, treasurers in newly established country committees will have a toolkit available uh, to be able to understand and walk into the, to the role, uh, even if they don't necessarily have the experience and the background knowledge themselves. I hope that's, uh, that's it. Great, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Josh. All righty, now we've got uh, a question for our council count candidates. So uh, this question then will be asked to all the three of you and they've been randomized again. So first we'll have Heather and then Summer and then Anne. Okay, and the question is, without using any metaphors about toothpaste or weeds, would you update our current risk management policy with regards to FEC compliance? And if so, in what way? How do you intend to ensure that any changes are in compliance with re FEC regulations? Heather, please, you have two and a half minutes. Okay, thank you for this question. Um, I don't uh, believe that uh, we need to update uh, our risk management uh, policy regarding the FEC compliance. I believe that what we need is to do some work on the ground, um, perhaps with uh, Josh's uh, deputies from his uh, um, Office of International Treasurer and deputies from the Office of International Counsel who will be specifically designated to work uh, with the uh, country committees to smooth out the bumps so that the where they're having difficulty with compliance so that we address their specific circumstances and understand what's going on uh, country by country and help them uh, with their compliance issues. Um, but I don't think that, uh, that they, uh, Risk, risk risk management compliance needs to be readjusted or adapted. Um, I believe that uh, the policy itself needs to be implemented and needs to be uh, worked through uh, and that we will achieve uh, great success uh, in being able to fundraise uh, significant amounts of money for the organization um, using this, uh, this uh, procedure now. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, so next, uh, Summer, the same question. Please, you have two and a half minutes. Um, so my approach would be that generally everything would be reviewed. Um, I think anytime you're taking over an office, um, that's just an order, you should review everything. The changes that would be made would be according to what made the most sense and was most practical practical in terms of getting us to that goal that I mentioned earlier of compliance. Um, that being said, I think that there are two things that I bring to this role that would benefit the organization as a whole. The first thing is completely fresh eyes. Um, I'm guilty of it. If I have written a contract, I do not, I'm, I'm, I'm married to it. And so I'm very sensitive about what's taken out, what's added, um, because it's my work. It's my baby. As Erica Badu says, I'm sensitive about my stuff. 
Um, but when you are from outside, if it's a contract that someone else has written, if it's something that someone else has done, then you can look at it from the vantage point of like what makes the most sense and what is the best here. So that's number one. I bring to the table fresh eyes. Um, with that being my general attitude towards it, I also am aware that the people who are working with this uh, with these problems every day have lots and lots of information about them and also have ideas on how to solve them. And so I think it would have to be as we're reviewing um, everything, which I think is in order, um, it would have to be a collaborative um, work between um, the executive committee and also the country committees in terms of figuring out like just what the best solution is to all of these problems that we're faced with. Great, thank you so much, Summer. Okay, and now we'll turn to Anne, the same question. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, obviously, Heather and I are gonna disagree on this one. Um, I, I, My answer is twofold. One, it was a committee set up by the DPCA last year to study this exact issue and see what kind of changes should be made. If any, the committee's final report isn't even due until the, uh, the meeting next in 2024. So, I would, that committee needs a new chairperson, that person resigned. It needs three attorneys to be appointed with various areas of expertise. Um, that needs to happen. Um, the new chair is going to have to, together with the XCOM, is going to have to appoint those people. And we need to let that committee do its work. The second thing is, I would like to answer what you said about how do we do this while ensuring compliance with the law and the regulations. I think that the word law has been misconstrued. There's two kinds of law in the US, statutory law and case law. Statutory law is passed by the legislative branch and signed by the executive. Usually there's other ways, there's initiatives and things like that. Case law is law that comes from the courts. Here we're talking about regulations. The FEC has regulations that they've adopted that are designed to interpret the law that applies to them. However, there is absolutely nothing in those FEC regulations that specifically spells out uh, reporting and compliance requirements for political entities overseas or abroad, which is what we are. So we're trying to interpret them in ways that to make them apply to us. And to say that somebody's interpretation is the law that must be followed is simply not true. So that would be my starting point on that. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne. Okay, um, we've come to the end of our pre-design questions. So we'll go down to the second half of our um, event today. So I'm going to pass the, the baton over to Kenton, who's going to chair the second half. And at this point, then we're going to take questions in the chat. So Kenton, please. Uh, All right, thank you, Danny. As Danny said, we're going to take questions in the chat, but there's a way that we're going to do this. So let me explain to you how this will happen. Um, questions will be answered by all candidates for position, unless your question is personally oriented to a particular person, such as, what did you mean when you said such and such? And to ask a question then, please write star star hand up in the chat and indicate which position your question is for. We will go in order of the questions received in the chat and please keep your questions extremely brief and we will cut you off if necessary. Please do not put your hand up in the chat until we uh, begin that, until I say that you can begin. So all answers for each question will be two and a half minutes. And uh, Kathy, again, will wave to the candidates or will uh, uh, indicate to the candidates when there are 10 seconds left. Okay, so with that, we will then begin with the question period, and I cannot see the chat at the moment. Let me just skip there. So um, the queue is Bob Bailly. Moi, c'est moi. Bonsoir. <clears throat> Hello, I'm turning on my camera. Oh, there we are. Hi. So this is a question not related to anything that's been asked so far. <clears throat> and it's not necessarily specific to your positions it's about the organization itself and the stance it should take and actions it should take with regard to political activities in the United States. As you know, because you read the news every day, 
everywhere LGBT, especially T, rights are under attack in states and territories wide and far. What kind of position, both rhetorical, by which I mean in terms of a statement, in terms of a policy position, in terms of a platform position, and what kind of action, concrete actions, should Democrats abroad take with regard to these kinds of um, attacks on our community, my community, our community, our community is my community and mine is yours, because we're all in this together and in the middle of inclusion, there's us. Um, uh, what kinds of uh, rhetorical stance, what kind of activities should we undertake to redress these blatant attacks on human rights? Okay, Bob, uh, just to check, this question was indicated to anyone, is that correct? That is correct. Okay, is there anyone who would like to answer this question then? Um, I would, if that's all right. All right, let's go ahead. Um, so I've seen a lot of bad news coming out of the states, some of which is immediately reacted to by our caucuses, some of it is immediately reacted to by our global organization. And I think that what's currently happening, specifically with regard to the LGBTQ so-called laws or and anti-LGBTQ um, movements is that DA does need to make a global statement. Now, I say this as a secretary, I wouldn't be able to make a statement by myself. Um, I think that making a public statement is, however, the right thing to do. Um, and in terms of what we can do, we can advocate for our members and anybody else out there to go home and vote. And if you can't vote, vote in your local election, which some people cannot because they do not intend to return, which limits their voting powers, they should get on the horn and call everybody else that they know and say, go vote. This is one of the great things about a grassroots organization and about our organization is that we know a lot of people. We might only be 200,000 people, but we can call everybody that we know and say, did you vote? Have you said anything? Can you make a statement? Make it at your local school board, make it in your company, go get people to vote so that we get the, pe the people that we need in office, not only nationally, but locally. So those are some of the things that I think we could do. We can, of course, also advocate and advocate when I say, I mean, for us in Congress, uh, we do have connections to people in Congress. And I know that the LGBTQ caucus has really specific ones, which is fantastic. And they are great connections. They're both ways, they go both ways. We call them and they also say, hey, I'm available. But it's really important that every single person in our organization reach out to everybody that they know. And they're not gonna do it if we don't make a statement from the global level about what's happening. 10 seconds. How, how specific we get is gonna be up to the chair, but I would support it and I'm more than willing to help. Thank you, Karen. Um, would any other candidate like to address this question? Josh, yeah, go ahead. I would like to, thank you, Kenton. Uh, and thanks, Bob, for asking. Um, you know, I, I agree with Karen. I think, uh, you know, we obviously have a comms policy that we don't comment on foreign policy or the domestic politics of other countries. But I think we are well within our rights to comment on the domestic politics of our own country. Uh, if anything, I think we've been maybe a little too strict on, on you know, limiting our, our comm statements only to issues specifically <laughs> impacting Americans overseas. Of course, that is our bread and butter. But I think it's completely appropriate for us to, to step in and just speak up when there are issues affecting our values. Um, I, I remember during the Trump years in particular, there were the Women's March, March for Our Lives, March for Science, all these, uh, these activities which were just standing up. And we had people in this, well, many of this, frankly, was during COVID even, where we had people online holding up placards saying, you know, enough is enough and March for Our Lives. And, and this is things which impact our friends and family living back home, thereby impacting us as expats living overseas as well. Uh, so by all means, I would support us 
taking stances, putting out comms, pushing the Democratic Party itself. You mentioned our platform. Yes, we support the Democratic platform, but we also issue our own platform, which in which we can actually advocate for the issues that are most near and dear to ourselves. Uh, and in some cases, push the DNC beyond where it would otherwise go. So I think that is, uh, by all means, within our within our realm. Uh, and the last thing I would say for in terms of specific actions, we've had a, um, and I think it's still ongoing, but maybe not quite as much as it used to be, uh, a, a method of tiny actions, uh, little steps that individual members can take to call their their uh, their reps and their senators back home. Um, this is exactly the type of thing that I think would would be well suited for a tiny action uh, of someone to write a postcard, make a phone call, uh, and make their voice heard on on issues that that matter to them and to their friends and family. Great, right, thank you, Josh. Um, Summer, you like to go next? I would please. I would like to say that um, while I recognize that we are in the Biden years, it doesn't particularly feel like the Trump years are over to me and they feel like, you know, they could reemerge um, in a substantial way at, at any time we got really close um, to another four years. Um, I think that one of the problems that we can address is the leadership in the, the in, in Democrats abroad, which I, I really do believe that what we like what we choose to do in terms of um, who is represented in our leadership, who we are choosing to give a platform, who are we who are we supporting um, makes a difference in terms of uh, how how visible different issues are. Um, I know that uh, LGBTQ uh, people, pretty much anyone who is not um, white, heterosexual, male, um, has been under attack in the last few years. Um, and the representation in terms of the party overall has not really changed very much. But I think that we have an opportunity here to really take a critical look at who we are choosing to lead these conversations. Um, so I think one of the best ways to ensure that um, these issues are dealt with is making sure that we are including the people that are affected. So rather than, you know, taking us then only taking a stance on a particular issue, what I would like to see is I would like for us to really actually engage on every single level, people from different demographics. Thank you very much. Heather or Anne, would you like to speak to this? Yeah, I would, I would like to also speak, may I? Go ahead, yes. Okay, so I, I would like to echo what uh, Josh was saying. I, I think that uh, we do have to speak up to our values. Um, at all times uh, and to make those uh, statements as part of uh, a uh, resounding uh, resounding statement for what we believe in. And uh, we do need to come forward with uh, a strong statement in our platform and uh, push the Democratic Party forward. Um, and I think that is one of the places where we can be most effective um, because we do have uh, an eye on the world and we see things differently. So um, I, would, uh, I would strongly encourage uh, the XCOM to be vocal and supportive um, in communicating our values whenever there are um, attacks on the civil rights of the LGBTQ community in the United States um, and, uh, and also to make sure that we reflect it uh, in, our, in our platform in a way that will also push the Democratic Party uh, to be as strong as possible. Thank you, Heather. Anne, would you like to comment as well? Yeah, I would just like to say that um, I agree with Heather on everything she just said on that issue. And I also um, would add that I think that we should continue to 
and maybe even up our efforts when it comes to participating in pride events. I know we do that already. I know Ireland has one coming up in June and we're getting ready to participate in that. But um, I think doing so, it does, it's not commenting on the politics of other countries. It's just showing support for the community and, and it's making us more visible. And I think we need to be as visible as possible on the issues that we care about. And it's just going to attract more members um, to us to be visible on issues like that. Thank you very much, Anne. All right, then we'll move on to the next uh, person in the queue, which will be Lama uh, Malaika Kasumi from Germany. Go ahead and pose your question. Okay, yes. Um, the, co the code of conduct being a set of rules outlining norms, rules and regulation on responsibilities of a particular organization. My question is three, threefold. First of all, the current code of conduct, does it reflect our values? What needs to be revised in your opinion and how will this be enforced? That's my all right. question. This, okay, this question is to the council candidates. So we'll start with Heather. So let, let's just uh, re, to repeat it's how does it how does it reflect our values? Um, the current um, code of conduct does it reflect our values? Does it what revisions would do so, and how would it be enforced? And maybe how would this enforcement differ from what has already happened? Okay, so um, let let's just start by saying that the current code of conduct uh, is. Uh, somewhat vague in the way in which it is drafted and it's out of date. Um, it's lacking in, uh, in um, many of the provisions that would make it uh, a useful um, document in terms of its enforceability. Um, it's lacking terms in terms of uh, how would you uh, file a claim and who do you file it with and how long does it does it take to um, get a response and so forth and so on. A lot of the nuts and bolts. In terms of reflecting values, it, it's somewhat vague and I don't think that it, uh, it adequately reflects our values as a party and it could stand a, a refresh. Um, what it needs is it needs a, uh, a re-examination in light of the values of the party. Um, it needs to take a look at uh, who we are, um, some outreach to uh, um, members of, uh, of our communities uh, from the different caucuses, uh, younger voters, uh, um, black voters, uh, people with uh, disabilities, we need to make sure that the code of conduct is addressing all of uh, the situations that uh, that could possibly arise in, uh, in those, uh, in situations where people could perhaps be um, mistreated or harassed and it needs to be better reflected uh, in that way. And then it does need to have the nuts and bolts of how to make a claim and who processes it and how you can uh, be assured that you get uh, satisfactory results. Thank you, Heather. Um, next up was Anne. All right, um, I don't disagree with that. I think we need, um, we need a more sp specific enforcement mechanism. We need more specifics in terms of the process. But I also, I'll just reiterate what I said before. I think that we're not enforcing the code of conduct we even have. And that's gotta be the starting point. All right, thank you. And then Summer. Um, I would say that generally a code of conduct should be a living document, um, especially in our current times. Um, for instance, a change in the code of conduct that I just had to made, make involved doxing, which did not exist uh, for the previous version of the code of conduct. And if you don't know what doxing is, it's uh, releasing the pub the private details of a uh, pri uh, otherwise private person on the internet. Um, so there are things that are happening every day that weren't happening 
five years ago, two years ago, six months ago. And so because of that, you always want a living, breathing code of conduct. And so, as I mentioned before, I think one of the things that's imperative, just in terms of when you're starting, um, when you're starting a new era, which I really hope that this is going to be, um, is to review everything. And just generally speaking, you should kind of have an ongoing review of the code of conduct. And in terms of whether a, co a code of conduct should reflect values, I think that that's a difficult that's a difficult thing to do. I think generally speaking, if you want, I always, when I'm explaining, um, when I'm explaining, like I'm talking about contracts a lot because it's, this is making me think of it. But when I, when I'm explaining to the business people at work, um, what makes a good contract, a, co a good contract, a lot of people think that um, oh, you have to have a lot of teeth and it needs to be like, in order for it to be a good contract, it has to make sure that we'll win in court. And it's like, no, the best contract is one where you never end up in court because everyone knows what they need to do. Everyone is capable of doing it. Um, and there really is that intention to fulfill their end of the deal. And I think that that's true of a code of conduct as well. You need a code of conduct that is not necessarily just reflective of the values of the organization, but is something that everyone can understand, everyone can do. And then you have less of a, a need to enforce it, if that makes sense. So you need a document that is reflective um, of the problems that you're facing. It's reflective, it's reflective of the people that it's serving. All right, thank you very much, Summer. Um, from here on out, we will um, limit the responses to two minutes because the queue is getting longer and the, uh, uh, the questions, uh, uh, the responses to the answers are um, uh, somewhat involved and detailed and lengthy, which is what they should be. But in order to give the uh, maximum number of people an opportunity to ask a question, we will therefore limit the um, uh, responses to two minutes. All right, so next in the queue, we have Beth. And her question will be directed to all of the candidates. Beth, are you there? Yes. Hi, Kenton. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, and yes, my pronouns are they, them. Are thank they you. Them. Um, um, so my question involves the concept of relational organizing. There have been several questions and answers that mention building teams. Specifically, how will you build your team? How do you motivate them or assist others to motivate theirs? And importantly, specifically, how do you appreciate your team and peers and say thank you? All right, thank you. Then we will begin with, uh, with Summer this time. Um, so, I want to talk about just like a briefly an experience that I had. Um, so I feel the the theme of outsiders coming up a lot for me. And I think that part of the reason why I put myself forth is because I've had the experience kind of just generally as I've navigated life of um, having an administrative team that was not reflective of me whatsoever. So what that meant was that when I had a problem, which is inevitable, whenever you have a situation where um, you are a part of an organization where the leadership is not necessarily reflective of the entirety of the group, um, where there was tension when I would want to go and talk about a problem that I had as a Black woman, because there are things that come up that only affect Black women, or there are things that are affecting me specifically because I'm a black woman or because I'm a young person or so on and so on and so, so forth. You can enter whatever um, specific thing that makes you different from that administrative body. And there just really is not a substitute for having people um, on the team that are reflective of the constituents. It's just a necessary thing. You cannot substitute it. And so one of my primary, one of my primary goals would be to create a team that was um, reflective of all of us. And so that means that we have a better chance at solving the problems that face all of us. And so that would be my number one priority. Um, 
And so I can, I can answer more specifically, but that's generally. Nice. All right, thank you, Summer. We will now move yeah. on to Karen. Oh. Karen, are you there? I think she's frozen. Okay, then we will come back to Karen and go down uh, to Josh. Yeah, thank you very much for the question, Beth. Um, I think, uh, you know, I'll echo a bit of what Summer just said. I hope to build a team of people whose skills complement mine. Um, so particularly for the treasurer role, I think that it does require a bit of experience. And I'm going to use the word experience in quotes because I think that experience can itself be uh, a diverse concept. Um, so by, by that, I mean people who come from having been in a treasurer role themselves from a country committee level, people who work in high finance, either for a big four auditing firm or you know, in some type of financial capacity. Um, I think all of this is relevant experience for, for bringing to the, the job of working in, at, a, at a DPCA, at a, at a political uh, treasury role. Um, so I, I think that there are areas where, you know, I have my own skill set, but I hope to, to find people uh, to build a team who, who have different skills than I do. Um, you know, in terms of, I guess, motivating them, I, I think it's two things. One is building trust. Um, sometimes we can kind of get each other down in this organization. And I think that that kind of demotivates. Uh, I hope that if we can actually just build a collaborative trusting environment where we all kind of get along, that will have a virtuous cycle, like I was saying, where we then want to spend more time with each other and want to and actually enjoy this work. Um, and then the other element of motivating is giving people ownership for for their own their own work product. Uh, when I if I have a team of of deputy treasurers, uh, you know, making clear like who is responsible for what element, uh, and then not taking credit for their work and not saying not presenting it as my own. If someone else did this, uh, you know, I can say this is on behalf of, of the office. Of treasurer but it, that it was it was spearheaded by by so and so um and then i think the last is on you said saying thank you uh just Fine. asking say thank you all right thank you josh then moving on to Anne. uh thank you um when we were doing these uh podcast recordings recently one of the questions that they asked was what do you like that your predecessors did and i answered that by saying that one of the things i liked was that the International Council set up this, uh, what he called Council of Councils. I don't know that I'd call it that or use it exactly the same way, but I think it makes sense to have councils, especially in different time zones, advising the International Council and providing input and, and helping with decision-making. Um, I think having them be in different parts of the world is helpful because nobody can be available 24 seven and these other um, deputy councils, um, if I were to if I were to have them and set that up, would be available uh, to talk to people who are in a time zone other than the one I'm in, or even outside of Europe generally, um, so that they can that people could be there and be helpful. I'd also like to see the um, the whatever this council of councils name is, if I'm doing it. Um, to be uh, available to help all the different caucuses and country committees as they have issues that come up. Um, so that if, for example, the taxation task force that I've been on has, a, has an issue, maybe needs uh, somebody to confer on an amicus brief on a tax case that's in court, that somebody, if not me, somebody else from that council um, advisory group could step in and help out when they have the time so that everything gets covered. And I think also, as was said earlier, in order to motivate people, we have to actually actively listen to what they have to say and respond to it, not just have people there to take up seats or to and say they support us, but to actually empower them. Thanks. Thank you, Anne. And I see that Karen has returned. So Karen, would you go next, please? Do you need the, uh, the question repeated or did you hear the question? Um, I did hear it, but would you mind repeating it? Because my connection was just about to die when, when Beth was speaking. Okay, Beth, can you repeat your question, please? Sure. Um, so this question involves the concept of 
relational organizing. There have been several questions and answers that mention building teams. Specifically, how will you build your team? How do you motivate them or assist others to motivate theirs? And importantly, specifically, how do you appreciate your team and peers and say thank you? That is a great question. And I think it's really relevant uh, for us in DA right now. So one of the things that makes me wanna be a volunteer is I think also one of the things that makes everybody else wanna be a volunteer. You want to help other people. You want to help people make their voices heard. We're not in this because we like to be wallflowers and we just let things happen. We wanna make things happen. And in order to build a team, you need people who want to work towards the same goal. I've seen a lot of people who have a lot of knowledge and who are able to do a lot of things, but without an overall plan and without a policy to follow and a clearly defined policy, I must say, not some policy that's hidden somewhere on page 198 of the wiki, but a policy that everybody knows about. This enables our volunteers to use their talents. So if there's a plan and it's a clear one and people understand it, then you can build a team. You can say, okay, I have a plan. I would like to improve internal communications and who wants to help me? Then people are gonna raise their hands. At least I would hope so. But what you need once you, those people have raised their hands is that you need to enable them and recognize them. Because if you say, okay, I'd like to collect all of your ideas, but I'm not gonna implement any of them. I'm just gonna write them down and stick them in a closet. That's not helpful. That's not motivational. People don't wanna work with you anymore and then people will leave. So I believe that helping our, to build a team, sorry, to build a team, you need volunteers who are recognized and who are valued. And how do you value somebody? That was one of your other questions. Give them the power to do the thing that they wanted to do. 10 it's seconds. not that hard. So recognize your people, enable them, and give them the tools that they need. That's my answer. Thank you, Karen. And then Heather, let me wrap it up. Thank you very much. So um, in terms of uh, building a team, um, I very much uh, would like to build out a team of uh, people for the Council of Councils, designating deputies for each of the regions and having layers of additional attorneys working um, from around the world, supporting the country committees, supporting the caucuses, supporting the state teams, supporting all the work that Democrats Abroad does in all of its different uh, aspects and uh, getting involved wherever, wherever needed in, a, in any which way, whether it's uh, briefs, whether it's uh, contracts uh, um, or any, any other uh, advice that's required. The people who are involved really do need to be uh, asked to do the kind of work that, they're, that they want to be engaged in. And I always believe this about uh, all volunteers in this organization that uh, every volunteer can be successful. And that includes our volunteer lawyers. They all have uh, fields of specialization and uh, things that they prefer to work on. We can uh, use them to their greatest success when they are happiest uh, doing the things that they are most comfortable with and, uh, and give them their credit where credit is due and uh, work with them, say thank you, um, bring them to meetings when, uh, when there are meetings, engage them and make sure that uh, you say please and thank you to all the other uh, people who are working in other teams that are working uh, with us, whether that's uh, in the treasurer's office or the secretary's office, wherever. It's always, so it's, oh, it doesn't hurt to be, to be nice. It always makes things go nice, go easier. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heather. Our next question will come from Julian, and this is for council. Thank you. The, the most recent International Council took the position that, that the International Executive Committee has the power to impose a, uh, on, on, on every member of a, uh, of, 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 an, of a country committee, executive committee, a ban on election to that, uh, uh, to that country 
committee for a period of five years. Is this correct? And if so, what is the authority uh, in the charter for this? Okay, we will begin with Heather. I'm not aware of the. I'm not aware of it, and I'm not aware of the uh, the basis for the for the provision under the charter. So I, I can't say that uh, I agree or disagree. Um, I would have to review the charter <laughs> in order to make a determination, but it's not uh, not something that uh, I can say off the top of my head. All right, thank you. And next okay. will be Summer. Um, I also uh, don't know, I would say in terms of what my, my general disposition would be. Um, I, I definitely think that I'm interested in making um, Democrats Abroad more democratic um, and part of the International Council's ro role is interpreting the charter and figuring out, you know, how, how to solve those questions. I think um, realistically, if we are, we are told by the founders, any government that does, doesn't serve us, we you know have a duty to replace and change. So I would be interested in figuring out what things are working for us and keeping those things and making those things better and figuring out what things aren't working for us um, collectively and changing those things to things that do serve us, but not serve just us because really ultimately the goal here, and I think that we haven't talked a lot about it, but the goal here is to get more Democrats in office. It is to save our democracy. Like it sounds very dramatic, but that is our goal. Um, I joined after not knowing anything about Democrats abroad, which really is a shame because I've lived in several different countries, but I think that that's indicative of a lot of people in my position. Millennials right now are the largest demographic in the workforce. Um, so there's a lot of people that we are just not reaching that we could be reaching. And part of that, I really do believe is making an organization that's just more functional, that reaches more people, that utilizes more of our tools, that utilizes social media, that serves Democrats. 10 seconds. So. All right. Thank you, Summer. And Anne, your response. Thank you, Julian, for this question. Um, I do know what he's talking about. There was uh, letters that went out from the Office of International Council to four countries. And one of those letters uh, said that it would be recommended to the International XCOM that all of the members of the country committee XCOM not be allowed to run for office for five years. And when that issue came up, I did examine the charter uh, and there is no basis in our charter for doing that. Um, there are provisions for suspending individual individual members, and there's hearings that are to be called for if that's to if that's proposed, if that's um, to be done. But there's no um, there's no basis in the charter for suspending people from running for office for five years. Thank you very much, Anne. So we will go to the next person in the queue, and that will be Rich. And this question is also directed to the council. Rich, are you there? Rich? Okay, if Rich is there, we will come back to him later, then we'll skip and go to Andrew, who also has a question for the council candidates. Thank you. Um, my, I'll just repeat what I tried to put in the chat. I'm a counsel in Norway and I consider myself effectively a solo practitioner. I practice law for 30 years, but I haven't practiced in uh, at least 15. Um, and the one thing that should scare any lawyer is uh, not being competent. And the usual way lawyers gain competency, to be very frank, is they pick up the phone and then they get into the books. And now I guess that you go online. I was very excited uh, by the idea of the Council of Council. And I will echo what Ann said 
about that being one of the things uh, that I would uh, give points to the entire uh, predecessor group for doing. And I anxiously await uh, seeing that flushed out even more. So my question to all three of you is, apart from recognizing all of your qualifications, excuse me, <coughs> I see the Council of Councils effectively um, being a mid-sized law firm, and some of you have already flushed it out in your answers, but I'd be grateful if you could just direct yourselves to what experience you have uh, in managing such a group of lawyers, because managing lawyers is a skill set of its own. All right. Thank you thank very you. much. Uh, Summer, would you like to begin, please? Um, sure. So um, as I mentioned, I'm head of legal right now, and so I manage... Um, the internal legal team. I also manage a ton of external uh, lawyers. That is, um, that is probably, I, I would say, the majority of of uh, my job. Well, generally, it's it is. I am the legal guardian of the organization, but also that's a big part of it. Um, I also am pro bono general counsel for a nonprofit, and so. I've managed um, uh, volunteer lawyers in that capacity as well. I um, I am a practicing. I'm a uh, the, there is there is um, something to uh, keeping your skills sharp, and I am I'm a practicing lawyer. I I am um, in the middle of it. I am in the middle of my legal practice. Um, I would say that I'm unusual in that I think the average age for a general counsel is 55 and I'm definitely not 55. Um, so I don't want anyone here to uh, confuse age and experience. They don't always necessarily match up. I have plenty of experience um, and I have experience, most importantly, building teams from up from the ground. Um, that is actually my specialty, I would say, um, creating legal teams where there wasn't, there was no legal team. So, um, yeah, so I'm definitely very good and still practicing. All right. Thank you very much. And would you like to go next, please? Okay. Um, I'll be honest with you, Andrew. I don't have experience managing a midsize law firm. I started out working at one about 50, uh, team of about 50 lawyers at a midsize firm in Phoenix. Um, I worked for other small firms, and then I did manage my own small firm that had five employees, um, but only one of those other employees was a lawyer, so it was just the two of us, and then support staff and tax preparers. Um, I do have management experience. It predates my time when the law, I was a newspaper editor where I managed uh, teams of reporters and photographers and other sorts of journalists. Um, and I think that that kind of um, management experience would transfer well to this, but I think that uh, it, I would like to see um, whatever form the Council of Council takes going forward to be one of collaboration. And while sure the International Council is the person in charge, I would, I would really favor a, as a collaborative approach as possible. Thank you, Anne. And Heather, your response, please. Okay, so thank you, Andy, for the question. Um, I have been uh, a uh, practicing attorney for 30 years, and um, I was uh, a senior partner at one of the largest law firms in uh, Tel Aviv until 2017, where I led many uh, international uh, mergers and acquisitions uh, with uh, numerous teams of attorneys, which... Uh, many of them running simultaneously. So I have the experience of running uh, many, many kinds of uh, transactions simultaneously and uh, managing those, uh, those attorneys and uh, support staff, which is much like uh, running a, uh, mid, a mid-sized law firm uh, on my own. Uh, with, and uh, for a period of time, I was also the managing uh, partner for the mergers and acquisitions department of, uh, of the firm. Um, and it was uh, a very large section of the firm. 
So um, I do have a lot of managerial experience in managing lawyers. Uh, and uh, it's something that uh, I do bring uh, with, uh, with me. And it's uh, something that uh, for the last two years as uh, deputy counsel, I have uh, gained the uh, trust and experience and uh, of the other members of the Council of Councils to work cooperatively with them and uh, believe that uh, I can continue to do that uh, going forward as uh, international counsel. My thanks to all three. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. And so we will go to our next question and that's from Marnie and this is to all the candidates. Yes, thanks so much. Um, I, uh, I don't think I'm t letting any secrets out that there's always in any membership organization going to be many different points of view about what the organization should be, never mind how it should do things. Um, but, um, I, I, you know, I think a lot of, a lot of, there needs to, there are a lot of qualities. I don't know exactly how to say what I'm going to say. There, there are a lot of qualities. I think we, we can benefit from uh, from individuals in terms of minimizing conflict, in terms of honoring the past, but really looking towards the future. Um, there are just so many so many different qualities that are really important. And I thought I don't know if I'm really the last person, but I thought it would be really cool to hear from your point of view. Sorry, I've been off the screen. From your point of view. What is the quality that you in yourself, how much do you hate these kind of questions, but what's the quality in yourself that is going to benefit um, this organization that's most important as you take in this year at this time as you take take a position replacing somebody else I think that's the case in all in all these cases. Okay, thank you Marty for the question. Sure, sure. And we will begin with Anne. Oops, sorry. Okay, well, um, <clears throat> I think that uh, the qualities that I have that would best serve me here are my um, approach to collaboration, to working with others, to always treating everyone I'm working with with respect and active listening to what other people have to say. All right, thank you. I just had to turn on some lights here because it's getting a little bit dark. So then we will move on to Karen. Thank you so much. Um, that's a really good question. And I wanna say, um, before I answer your question, Marnie, that Marnie's Disability Caucus hosted the first webinar that totally transfixed me from all of the caucuses, including mine, which is the AAPI Caucus. Um, one of the great things that I have been able to do by working with the caucuses is to see other people's point of view. And, you know, when I was 14, I remember having a conversation with my dad and I said, this is what I think, and this has got to be right. And he said, you don't know anything. And then I turned 18 and I said, wow, you know what? I don't know anything. And as I work with all the caucuses and I see these amazing events and these different points of view that they all put out, the Disabilities Caucus, the Black Caucus, the Asian Caucus, the Hispanic Caucus, the Seniors Caucus, the Youth Caucus, I could go on and on, the Women's Caucus, I can't name them all. But um, everybody has a different point of view. And what I think sets me apart, maybe not from everybody because I hope a lot of people think this, but what I know is that I don't know anything. There's some things that I know how to do, and I really love helping people. And that's one thing I do know how to do really well. But what I also know is that I haven't walked in anybody else's shoes. I've only walked in mine. So when somebody comes to me and says, this is what I think, this is my viewpoint, this is my experience, I try my utmost always to accept it and to say, how can I help you make things better? So I have seen a lot of our leaders um, who have done great work um, be surprised by this. 10 and seconds. I want to say, say this, I'm never not surprised when I discover I don't know something, but it's always a pleasure to be able to learn something new. Thank, Thank you. you, Karen. We'll move on to Heather.
So I, I think that uh, some of the qualities that uh, I have that most benefit will will most benefit the organization are my ability to uh, to uh, navigate the world differently and to listen to people deeply and interpret information. And sometimes I do that in a different way than uh, other people do, which brings about uh, different and diverse results. And I am a very effective leader and effective team builder. And I believe that all of these things make me a, uh, a person who is uh, a um, someone who who can truly give give of themselves and also receive from others what is being offered within the organization in order to build more. And I hope that that will be will will bring greater strength for everyone, both for myself and for DA, because that's what it's all about. Thank you, Heather. Can we move on to the summer? I am a person who is capable of leading this organization, not where in terms of legally, not just in terms of where we are right now, but in terms of where we're going. Just to give you an example of what I mean by that, I manage legal for a company that has done 2 billion in revenue in non-fiat currencies. What that means is we've done 2 billion in digital currency. This was not something that was possible 15 years ago. So what that what I'm saying is that where we are going is different than where we should be going is different than where we've been before. And I'm not an expert at everything. Anyone and anyone that any lawyer that tells you that they know everything is incorrect. Um, but what I am an expert at is becoming an expert. I am very good at identifying problems and at, and and coming up with solutions. Um, and I really believe that I am the best person. Like I said, I do this every day um, and I want to do it in a way that is serving um, us as a group, us as a party and us as a country. Thank you, Summer. Uh, then the last person to answer this question will be Josh. Yeah, thank you for the question, Marnie. This is a, a great question. Um, so though some of you who know me might know that uh, in addition to my day job, I'm also the, the chair of our staff association, uh, which is really kind of like a union, but more specifically, it's like a works council. And what is the difference between that is that, you know, a union uh, is kind of the, the collective body, which has collective bargaining vis-a-vis -vis management, but a works council has co-determination where we work together collaboratively with management uh, to try to represent the interests of staff and come to mutually agreed uh, decisions. Um, why do I bring this up? Because my, in my role as chair, I have kind of two main responsibilities, which I think will benefit me very, very well in Democrats abroad. One is managing the elected staff representatives who themselves come with very strong, diverse views. If you run to be a staff representative, you generally are pretty outspoken. Uh, and, and that creates a lively, lively uh, open dynamic in our, in our internal de deliberations. But what we do is at the end of those deliberations, we always reach a, a, a consensus view, a sense of solidarity so that when we approach management, we are speaking with one voice because management loves you know, divide and conquer. But when we speak in solidarity, we have a much stronger perspective. And then the second element that I do in this role is having the conversations vis-a-vis -vis management. This is not almost inevitably adversarial to some degree because I am representing the interests of staff and management are representing the interests of the organization. Uh, but there's a lot more common ground than you can think. And, and, and even when you're in this almost um, impossible to avoid adversarial circumstance, you can still find a, a, a sense of collegiality 
if they like the people, then Ten they seconds. will be more receptive to what we say. Uh, and, and so I can maintain a very strong relationship with the president of our institution uh, and, and uh -huh. still present my voice very strongly. Thank you. Thank you, candidates, for all those answers. We were supposed to have had one more question to be asked, but the person who wanted to ask it is no longer on the call. But I'm just going to check to make sure that I'm correct. Rich Hill, are you there to ask your question? Okay, apparently he has left. Then we will go directly to the final statements from each candidate, and we will then begin with Anne. So you have two minutes each for your final statements. Yeah, thank you. I'm not gonna speak for anywhere near two minutes. I'm just gonna say that um, I started out by talking about service and I think not the International Council and the entire international XCOM needs to be of service to the organization as a whole, the country committees, to all of the members. We need to all be working together for our common goals. We've got an important election coming up in 2024, and we need to be on the same page and working together instead of fighting against each other. There's too much conflict right now within the organization um, between the International XCOM and the country committees, and even within some of the country committees. And we need to find a way to all get together on the same page to stop fighting with each other and start working together so that we can be our very best in what we do the best. Thank you very much, Anne. We'll move on to Josh, your final statements, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much again to DA France, Germany, Spain, and UK for hosting us today. I've appreciated this open dialogue and hearing what issues are important to you. In each of the roles in which I have served across Democrats abroad, I've sought to combine my passions with my skill set in law and finance, ultimately with the goals of improving the governance of the organization, making us more effective at our core mission of getting out the vote, and reflecting our own values by making us more small d democratic. The financial issues we face, both at the global and country committee levels, range from the seemingly minor, for instance, handling cash and small dollar donations, to the systemic, establishing clear procedures for the governance of com country committee subaccounts working together to raise adequate funds to cover both global and country committee expenses, and above all, developing mutual trust and cooperation. I'm asking for your vote to serve as international treasurer to find practical, pragmatic, workable solutions to improve the way we manage our money and utilize our resources as efficiently as possible across the organization. Please feel free to reach out at josh4da at gmail.com. That's josh, the number four, da at gmail.com. If you have any ideas yourself or would like to discuss the ideas I'm bringing to the table to, to strengthen Democrats abroad's financial position. Thank you very much. And I would humbly ask for your vote. Thank you, Josh. Then we will move on to Heather. Your final statement, please. Thank you. If elected, there are several things I would do. First, I would engage a team of volunteer lawyers from around the world to serve on the Council of Councils and appoint deputies responsible for the three regions. This mini law firm works on DA issues, assesses potential liabilities and actions and conveys information appropriately throughout the organization in a timely manner. Secondly, I would set several priorities, review all of DA's policies in the context of our charter and bylaws, and make recommendations for improvements to them if needed, and implement those changes. Obtain cyber insurance for DA as the complexity and potential issues related to online activities increases from moment to moment. Create a, a secure repository for, for the Office of International Counsel to ensure institutional knowledge retention of our legal matters and their secure transmission to the International Council and their Council of Councils after each election. And explore the costs of trademark registration where DA has country committees and transnational committees and develop a plan to fund the registrations in order to protect DA's intellectual property around the world. Finally, I would set regular meetings with country committee councils to hear the issues they are facing and help develop processes to make their job easier. I'm a very experienced lawyer, able to provide independent counsel to the International XCOM and any parts of DA that require advice. 
I also have years of experience in managing teams of attorneys on complex transactions and investigations. I work well with others as indicated by the many people endorsing me. In conclusion, I'm confident I can bring the bring the benefit of extensive legal experience, an ability to listen and interpret information, a familiarity with how our organization works, and a proven commitment to making DA a more yes, effective, sir. diverse, and team-oriented organization. I would be deeply grateful for your support, and should I be elected, in your input and feedback. Stop. Thank you very much, Heather. We will now turn then to Summer. Um, I want to start by saying thank you for um, having me. I have um, been very, so I've been very um, happy at the amount that I've learned about um, Democrats abroad and about all of you and about all of your all of your needs. I want to ask for your support, your vote, and your continued dedication to um, the cause that we are all here for. Um, but I wanna make it clear that I am definitely the best person for this job. Um, I am an intellectual property lawyer. I am um, already leading a, a company that is doing business in 180 jurisdictions. I am already an inter international lawyer. I am already an expert in building a legal team. Um, and all of the things that I need, I would need um, to do in terms of bridging the gap between um, being the best international counsel for you um, are, are skills that I've already um, solidified in, in my work thus far. I think that I've talked a lot about um, the importance of picking the best person for the job and inclusion and change and opportunity and all of those things are important, but it does not, I don't want it to take away from the reality, which is um, that I am the best person. Um, I am the uh, only person that's that is uh, practicing as a general counsel in a, in a in a role that is very similar to this one. In fact, um, I would say that this is a smaller scale, and because of that, I have the chops to get us where we want to go. So I think that we are two hundred thousand now. I think that we can get ten seconds. I think that we can get to the millions and I'm the person that is able to manage that trans trans transition. Thank you very much, Summer. And to round this all up will be Karen. Thank you so much, Kenton. Um, I'd like to thank the country committees of France, Germany, and the UK and Spain for hosting this. Um, it's been lovely. Um, I wanna say the Democratic Party is a big tent party. So, Lots of people, lots of different ideas, and many different viewpoints. And as we grow at DA, we get more diverse viewpoints entering our, our arena. So we need a team of leaders who understand and have experience in communications, in team building, in inclusivity, and in planning in order to activate the overseas voters, not only our members, but the ones who aren't our members. And this team needs to understand what makes voters tick. This does not mean that we need to have people with an inside track or internal knowledge or internal connections. What it means is that we need a well-coordinated team with a clearly defined mission and a clear and actionable plan based on data analytics and the expertise of our volunteers, you guys. So I spoke before about joy and volunteering. That's really close to my heart. We can't have joy or even raise our voices if we aren't inclusive and we don't empower our volunteers. I'm asking for your vote for secretary so that I can help you make all of our voices heard, empower our volunteers, and possibly bring you a little bit of joy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. And with that, we have reached the end of our first Meet the Candidates session. Um, I would like to thank all the candidates on behalf of the four country committees who are hosting this, DA Spain, DA UK, DA France, and DA Germany. And um, to all of you who have uh, taken out some time of your busy schedules to attend this meeting tonight. And we hope that we will see you again on Friday. Uh, in two days when we will have the second Meet the Candidates sessions in which we will feature the 
candidates for chair and vice chair. So with that, I'd like to say thank you very much. Have a great evening, and then we'll see you all again on Friday. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Yep. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, Kenton. Thank you.